Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Third Age. We are so glad to have you here today, uh, in person and online. And for those of you who will be joining us later on through the Westminster's YouTube channel, where we have our past programs available. Today's Third Age Forum is Contemporary Understandings of Human Growth and Sexuality. We will begin by a prayer by Reverend Margaret Fox. She will then introduce today's speaker, Reverend Alexandra Jacob. I invite you to sit back and enjoy what is about to come. There will be time for questions, answers, and comments before we break for lunch. Margaret, please lead us in prayer. All right. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We ask your blessing on this time together. Help us to learn and explore and grow. We thank you for the gift of bodies. We thank you for the gift of sexuality. We thank you for the gift of love and relationship. And we thank you for Alexandra's presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good morning and welcome to Third Age for those who are in person and for those who are in line. I do want to point out that the slide bills it as though we have multiple Reverend Alexandra Jacobs. I regret to say we don't, there's only one. And I don't believe it's possible to clone her yet. Um, that's a subject for a later human growth and sexuality workshop. But we have Alexandra Jacob with us. And I wanted to start by introducing Alexandra and sharing a little bit about why we have Alexandra talking to us about this topic today. So our planning for Third Age happens very intensively in uh, a retreat that we have, a, a, a half-day retreat in the month of June, when the Third Age Committee, who are sort of conveniently clustered at this, this table back here, get together and plan and dream up topics for the year. And we wanted to have a topic that would, one of the topics that they wanted to cover was how do we understand human sexuality and how has that understanding changed over time? Right? We get from the church and from the culture different messages about our bodies and about sexuality, and probably the messages that I got as a kid are different from the messages that some of you got when, when you were kids and are different from the messages that the kids are getting today. So we thought it would be great to have Alexandra come and share with us her curriculum that she uses with um, the, the families, youth, and children here at Westminster and offer a space for us to talk about our understandings too. Many of us may know somebody um, who uses different pronouns from the ones that they were assigned at birth. Many of us uh, probably know more LGBT couples than we did as kids. You know, many of us are, are learning about sex and sexuality our whole lives long. Um, and so we're really grateful to have Reverend Alexandra Jacob here to help us out. So Alexandra, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Margaret. It's really good to be with you all. Um, I have to start by saying Usually my audience is like in the 6 to 12 year old age range. So this is really wonderful. Um, I'm going to share a lot of what we share with young folks at Westminster every year when we have this great workshop. Um, but I think that there is relevance uh, for, for all across the stages of life. So because I work with kids, I assume that our bodies need to be moving at sort of regular intervals throughout our time together today. Um, if that's not something that's comfortable for you, stay where you are, that's great. If I invite you to stand, you don't have to stand. Do, do what you need to do, do what your body needs to do. But I do wanna invite us to start um, in our hymnals, which is, in my opinion, one of the best places to start. Margaret saw that I carted in the hymnal cart and she said, oh, you brought Bibles. This is going to be like that kind of a thing. And I said, well, I brought my second favorite book. Glory to God, the Presbyterian hymnal. Um, so would you turn to hymn number 27? Uh, 
Um, our hymnal is full of really wonderful songs about a great diversity of things. And uh, because there are some hymns that are really specific to really specific topics, we don't often get to sing those in worship. I'm not sure exactly what the context of worship would be uh, in which we would sing this particular song, but I think it's a really lovely one that sort of invites us um, in a faithful way into the conversation that we're about to have. So uh, it's a sort of a strange tune, but I can't just read a hymn, I have to sing it. So, and I know there's some singers in the room, so I'm gonna start by singing the first verse. And if you sing, if you read music, if you know this hymn, I hope that you'll join along with me. Sacred the body God has created, temple of spirit that dwells deep inside. Cherish each person, nurture relation, treat flesh as holy that love may abide. Bodies are varied, made in all sizes, pale full of color, both fragile and strong. Holy the difference, gift of the maker, so let us honor each story and song. Love respects persons, bodies and boundaries, Love does not batter, neglect, or abuse. Love touches gently, never coercing. Love leaves the other with power to choose. Holy of holies, God ever-loving, Make us your temples, indwell all we do. May we be careful, tender and caring, so may our bodies give honor to you. Yeah, it's beautiful. I know, I know. This is a really great one. This is by um, Ruth Duck, who I think is still living. She is a wonderful hymn writer. Um, I do admit that, that most of my favorite hymns are, um, this is a big word, but it's a great word, multivalent. They have lots of different meanings. This is not one of those. This says exactly what it means, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just think it's a really lovely way to invite us into thinking about our bodies. Um, would you raise your hand if you enjoy thinking and talking about your body? Okay, a, a, few, a few people, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it is a multivalent question, March. A lot going on there. Um, this is, okay, one more question. Would you raise your hand if you have spent a lot of time at church throughout your life thinking and talking about your body? Yeah, I saw Ken sort of reaching down as if to say like the opposite of that. Um, a lot of us did not grow up having the kinds of conversations that we have at Westminster with our young ones. And um, I'm grateful to have stepped into a position here where there was already an established sort of program and protocol for how we talk about our growing and changing bodies for young ones. I did not create the Human Growth and Sexuality Workshop. It's been around for a long time. But it's a really wonderful thing that we do. And so I want to invite you into a sort of uncomfortable space if it feels uncomfortable for you. I think there may be some things that we talk about this morning um, that you've never thought about before or for some of us like wow we've been thinking about this for a long time because we live in bodies where we have to think about this all the time. So I want us to kind of think about that and to enter this um, with a spirit of humility and curiosity. So again, I spend a lot of time with teenagers um, and I'm gonna invite us into a practice that I use at the beginning of a lot of youth group stuff, which is um, if you can agree to these couple of things, would you give me a thumbs up? Here's the first thing. 
that we can use our ears and our minds before we use our mouths. That means we're thinking about the questions that we're asking. Thumbs up. And that we can, that we can enter the conversation with a spirit of humility and curiosity. Thumbs up. Cool. Thanks. That's a little covenant that we do together. Um, so as Margaret shared when she was introducing me, we have this wonderful human growth and sexuality workshop at Westminster. It usually happens around April, and we have this workshop to where by the time, if you've been around Westminster for your whole elementary experience, by the time you hit middle school, you should have had the opportunity to go through it two or three times. So one year it'll be kindergarten, first and second grade, the next year it'll be third, fourth and fifth, and Marie Kruskop has the math in her head, thankfully I don't have to work that out, but we, by the time you graduate into the youth group, you will have had a chance to think about these things, to think about the ways that our bodies um, operate in the world um, through a perspective of faith faith a number of times in different stages of your development. And then um, I won't talk about this as much today, but I'm happy to talk more with you individually if you're interested. This sort of evolves into um, our high school years. We have a, every other year a relationships retreat. So we go on retreats twice a year up to Clearwater Forest with our high school youth group. Every other year, the spring retreat focuses on healthy relationships. So that's um, relationships with our parents and caregivers and our families and friends and also intimate relationships. So this is sort of a, a spectrum of life thing that we start when kids are pretty young and that I hope sort of sets us up to have really good conversations across the age spectrum. Uh, we ground everything that we do, I hope, when we're at our best, in an understanding uh, of our bodies as good, beautiful, holy, created by God. That's really, really important. And that's part of why we do this at church. We know that kids are getting puberty education, sex education at school and maybe in community groups that they're a part of. But we feel like it's important to do that here uh, because we have something particular to say. And it has something to do with how God has created us. God has created us good and beautiful and holy. Um, so... This is my favorite psalm. I'm going to preach on this psalm later in March. Uh, psalm 139. Would somebody just read that verse out loud with your outside voice? <laughs> Thanks. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is one of those really succinct um, moments in scripture where I can lift a verse up and feel pretty good about sort of giving it to children and saying, this is a great one to memorize. Um, write it on your mirror, things like that, that, that sort of remind you that, you that your body is good, that God has created your body. Um, our bodies are complicated. They are contingent. They um, uh, invite us to ask really hard questions of ourselves and our neighbors, and they are good, and that's really, really important. The other way that I like to, to ground us biblically and theologically is in thinking about uh, how Jesus loves and cares for people's bodies. So I've got lots of exclamation points here. Again, I, I work with teenagers, so you have to sort of keep the energy up, you know? Um, Jesus spent a lot of time feeding people, he, he did not watch people go hungry and do nothing about it. He, there are these wonderful miracles of abundance where he shares food and he invites his disciples to do the sharing of food with people. He cares about their bodies. It's not just what's going on up here or in our hearts, but in our bodies. Jesus spends a lot of time healing people. This one is complicated, and, and we're not going to go there in, in this forum, but again, this is something I like to think about a lot. Um, Jesus spends a lot of time with people whose bodies, for whatever reason, fall outside of sort of a social norm, right? So we hear these stories where Jesus is healing someone of their blindness, or Megan preached a little bit about Jesus' stories of healing people of demons, which is not really a way that we speak anymore, many of us. Um, but these are really central stories to what's happening in the Gospels. And it has to do with people's bodies. Jesus shares meals with people. 
He spends a lot of time around tables, especially in the Gospel of Luke. If you sort of page through that Gospel, you start to count how many meals happen. Um, and one of my favorite stories in the Gospels comes after Jesus has, God has raised Jesus from the dead. Post-resurrection stories are so wonderful. Um, the disciples are on the beach and Jesus says, come and have breakfast. I love that because I love breakfast, but also because it's a wonderful story where Jesus um, is, is not just interested in what's going on in their minds and their hearts, but also what's going on in their bodies. They're hungry. It's time for breakfast. Okay, the last one is a little um, longer and a little silly, but serious. Creating the conditions by which people with bodies outside of a cultural norm could be welcomed back into community. So I think this is a lot of what's happening in, in the healing stories in the Gospels is, is Jesus encounters someone whose physical body, whatever it is, uh, doesn't allow them to participate in community in the way that Jesus would hope for, right? So there's, so there's something going on with their body, but there's also something going on with the culture and society and space that they live in that doesn't allow them with the body that they have to participate fully and to flourish as a person. And so in the healing stories, when Jesus heals somebody of their blindness, he's also creating the condition by which they can come back into society. So Jesus cares about people's bodies is the main point of that. There's a lot more um, that we could get into with these stories and it's really exciting to me and fun. So if you wanna talk about it more, let me know. Um, but, but with kids, I like to remind them the stories of Jesus are stories about people's bodies. Also, Jesus came in a body. There are lots of ways that, that this story might have gone and it went this way, where there was one person born in a body. So all that's to say, we can't just pretend like we are minds and spirits living without bodies. As much as we might like to live that way, I like to live that way sometimes, to pretend I don't have needs that need to be fulfilled, um, but that's just not the world that we live in. It's not the kind of faith that we have. So I would love for you to turn, uh, as, as much as you're willing to share, I don't want it, this to be a, a space of any kind of forced vulnerability, but, but I'm curious what your faith has had to say about navigating body stuff. So sexuality, gender, consent, autonomy, illness, body image, there are any number of directions you could go with this. But I want you to think a little bit about the messages um, from church, especially for those who were raised in church or for those uh, for whom church is a newer space. What, if anything, have you heard? This is around your tables. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna pull us back together. I hope, I hope that you could talk about this for, for a while, but I'm not gonna leave us here <laughs> because that would feel sad, I think, maybe. <clears throat> okay, so, so this is something that I also do with my teenagers. Um, my teenagers, our church's teenagers. <laughs> So this is, imagine this is a spectrum, okay? I'm gonna walk from here to the end of this stage. Right here is uh, the messages I grew up with at church around my body and sexuality. 100% uh, comfortable with them still, feels totally great what I learned and how I learned it, okay? At the other end is I'm deconstructing all of it. It feels all harmful and, and shameful and not okay. So I'm gonna walk, and when I get to the point where you think you are on the spectrum, would you just raise a hand? Okay. How you feel today about the messages you received. This end is totally awesome. That end is none of it was okay, and I'm um, maybe even I was harmed by it, and that happens to to people. 
Um, so this is a vulnerable question. You do not, you can opt out. You do not have to participate. But hopefully this is a way to sort of get us thinking about it. So I'm going to start walking, okay? Anybody at 100% feeling really good? Okay, we're, okay. Ken, Chris. All right, we're headed towards, I'm really unlearning some things. We're headed towards, I'm learn, unlearning all of the things. And we've reached, I'm unlearning all of the things. So I don't know if you were looking around, but we had people from almost at this end to all the way on this end. Uh, the church has a pretty spotty history at, at talking about bodies. That may be something obvious to say, but it's also important to say. And again, we could do a whole nother third age forum on what the church has taught us about our bodies and our, and our minds and the relationship between the two. Um, but what we hope at Westminster is that we can be a place where we uh, affirm the goodness of our bodies. Even when things are hard, and I know this is a group um, of folks in aging bodies, that's a lot of what you talk about in third age. And that can feel, uh, that's a complicated experience. Some of it is great, some of it is really hard. Same thing with puberty. Some of it is really great and some of it is really, really hard, right? So this is complicated stuff. And I hope that, um, that this, this, this space for our young ones and for you all is a space where we can think about some of those messages that we've inherited and also think about how to um, frame them in different ways, um, in ways that, that advance the flourishing of all people. Um, we'll talk about this towards the end, but the Human Growth and Sexuality Workshop is not just about um, my changing body, it's also about how I relate to other people's bodies. So we talk a lot about consent, about what it means to say yes to touch, um, and that's not just sexual touch, that's all kinds of touch. We talk about what it means to have autonomy over our bodies. Um, these, are, these are things that, that are sort of on the newer end of how we think about uh, children, I think. Um, and there are some generational things at play here too, right? Children relating to people in different generations, people in different generations relating to children. So part of what I hope we can do today is um, I can share with you all kind of the messages that we're sharing, and then we can talk together um, in the Q&A about how we sort of put this into practice, how we integrate this into our lives. Um, okay. One more activity. This involves your sticky notes. So we're going to move into a time of thinking about gender and sexuality, um, you don't all need a sticky note. Don't maybe just hold the sticky notes for till I. Sorry, I shouldn't have. That's a classic teaching error. Why would I tell you about the sticky notes before I? T <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so uh, this this question is intentionally in a binary. A binary is an either or: um, black, white, man, woman homosexual, heterosexual. We're gonna break all that down in a minute, but for now, just think in your binaries. What does the media, broadly, tell us about what it means to be a man or a woman? Okay, we're gonna live into our binaries. We're gonna write about women on the pink sticky notes, and we're gonna write about men on the blue sticky notes. Again, we're gonna break it all down, don't worry, but would you just write things down and then when you're done, bring your sticky notes up and post them up here. It's all, yeah. Okay, you can keep writing these if it's sort of a cathartic experience for you. Um, so here's, here are some general themes for on the, on the men side of things. Assertive, strong, always right and never wrong. No, oh, that was poetic. I guess I'm a poet. <clears throat> Thanks, Barbara. Um, sports heroes, caring fathers. That's a good one. Um, mixed messages. A lot of people wrote that on both of them. Decisive, loud, whatever you want. It's okay to be old. It's okay to be gray-haired if you're a man. 
Here's some of the things on the pink sticky notes, the lady side of things. Um, yeah, do and be all the things, but you'll still get criticized for it. Uh, manage the household and have a full-time job. Be soft, feminine, depend on men. Uh, be the primary caregiver uh, for children. Uh, subservient, gentle, delicate, caring, supportive, pure. Woo! Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is something that we do, uh, and I owe this to Sonia Dukowski, our children's director. This, this was her idea with the older group of kids. So when we're doing this workshop with, you know, fourth and fifth graders who um, could maybe articulate some of these things already, which is sad and true, um, she has them put them on the whiteboard and, and then reads them off, and then every kid gets to take a handful and just rip them up. Um, which is a nice, uh, a nice way to handle these things. But, and I will recycle these. These will not, I'm not gonna like, you know, post them anywhere. I also won't burn them because Nicole said I can't, but that would feel good too, probably. Um, so what I want, the point of this exercise is that gender and sexuality is everywhere. I mean, everywhere. You can watch like a tire commercial and there's something sexual about it, weirdly. I mean, literally anything. You all know this. You live in the world. Um, and this kind of stuff shapes us. It shapes us in ways that can, uh, that can mark us for life, really. Um, and some of it is really hard and harmful. I know that uh, in this room, there are probably countless stories of the ways that um, what, what you have been told it means to be a man or a woman has affected your life in a way that, that has harmed you. And so those stories are really important. I hope that those are stories that we can learn to tell one another. Because when we tell one another our stories, we have the power to, um, to change things for a new generation. That, so that we can get kids who come into youth group um, feeling less bound by these things than I did when I was their age, which was not that long ago. Um, these things can change and we have the power to change them. So I am, I'm gonna turn us now to uh, a, a really great teaching tool called the gender-bred person. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, and I have handouts, I, thanks Margaret, for you to, you can take this home and think about it and um, the next, I'm going to give you a tiny peek of the next slide, a lot of words. You have those words on your handout, so have no fear. Has anyone seen this before, the gender-bred person? One person, okay, cool. So this will not be new information for some, a couple of you, but um, for a lot of us it will, will feel new. So this is a teaching tool that is uh, not particularly old, but this is the fourth iteration of it. So it's been around at least, I think, since I was in high school, maybe 10 years probably. Um, and it's a way, a really concise way for us to think about and suss out the differences between gender identity, attraction, gender expression, and sex. So for some of us, we're thinking, okay, kind of thought those were all the same thing. That's okay. Um, we're all coming at this from probably really different places. And so again, I want to invite you into a place of curiosity and humility for yourself and for your neighbors. Um, don't flip to the next page yet. Some of you are looking way too far ahead. I know this is the danger of handouts. It's the danger of handouts. So stay here with me for just a moment, okay? Up at the brain part, okay, one more disclaimer. This is very reductive. 
okay? It, it's a teaching tool. Teaching tools are often reductive. They reduce something very complicated into a nice little picture that you can look at. Um, I think it's a good teaching tool. It's not perfect. Nothing ever is. Uh, but things are complicated and we're always learning more. So when I teach this class to the kids in five years, probably it's going to look really different. I went back and um, some of our files and saw sort of how we were teaching this workshop five years ago. And it wasn't too different, but we were not talking about the gender-bred person. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's sort of a different landscape. So things are always changing. This is sort of reductive and it's helpful. So let's start up at the brain. Gender identity. I'm gonna pull out my second page of the handout, but I want you to stay on this one. <laughs> So when we talk about gender identity, we're thinking about how you define your gender based on how you align or don't align with what the options for gender may or may not be. Okay, this is about how we're understanding things in our minds. Let's move to expression. So the, the little dotted line for expression is around the whole little guy there, little person there. Um, that's about how we express ourselves on the outside. Um, I would say that I am, uh, I should have started with this. I am a woman, I am a cisgendered woman, and I express myself in ways that have been taught to me as ways that women express themselves. I walk into a room and people probably look at me and think, that's a woman. Um, there are lots of ways to express ourselves, though. You all know this from living in the world. Uh, and that's what expression is about. It's about how we dress ourselves, it's about how we walk into a room, and it's a lot about how other people are perceiving us, which is the complicated part, right? So this is not a fixed thing. None of this is fixed, actually. It all can change. Okay, let's move to sex. So the, the genitalia area is what's going on here. This is about the physical traits that we're born with or that develop as well as the sex that we're assigned when we're born, which may or may not be the sex that we have now. These things change too, okay? And then the little heart, attraction. How do you feel drawn to other people? This uh, can be sexual or romantic or other things this sometimes has to do with gender. I might be a person who is attracted to people that identify as one gender or two genders or lots of genders. That's attraction. Okay, now you can turn to your next page. I know, you're just chomping at the bit. Okay, this is a lot of words. <laughs> Uh, we are not going to read all the words now, but I do hope that this is something that you can take home with you, sort of think about and digest. Um, and there, if you Google gender-bred person, there's a whole set of resources on a website, and it's all really good, I think. Um, it's the, the person who created this. Um, and, and this, like I said, is the fourth iteration of the gender-bred person. There are other iterations, and it's kind of cool to hear the creator talk about how it's changed over just this short amount of time. Pretty cool. So the things that I walked you through, those are all words here that you can read on this page. Um, and then on the bottom part of the page, which is not on this slide, but it's on your handout, with these little arrows, this is uh, the creator of this tool, it's his way of thinking about um, a, a spectrum. So, so the gist of it is all of these things exist not in a binary. Remember we talked about binaries, black, white, good, bad, man, woman. 
but on a spectrum, just like I walked here. There's a spectrum of I express myself as a man or I express myself, right? And notice that in the spectrum, it's not man on one side and woman on the other side. It's degrees of a thing, right? So it's not like I express myself as a man, kind of like a man, kind of like a woman, and like a woman, it's like I express myself just kind of not really going into the gender uh, stereotypes of things or more towards how we think a woman would dress or act. So the spectrum totally breaks the binary down. Okay. I would like for you to take a moment at your tables This is another thing that I, we do this in confirmation when we've just talked about a totally wild thing, which is usually not this. It's usually like, how can God be a man and God? That kind of a thing. What's a takeaway from this tool? And what's a question that you're left with? Okay, because I see faces of varying degrees of confusion and excitement. And that's great. That's what I expected from this workshop. But would you share something you'll take away and a question that you have just in your tables? Okay. I'm going to pull us back together. I was... I was listening in to one group that was like, mind blown. Maybe you're feeling that way too. I'd like to hear a takeaway. Or is anyone willing to share a takeaway? Sue? Or maybe we've got one from the live stream. Oh, you've got a mic, excellent. Yes, I've got one from the live stream. Takeaway, fluidity. Why is fluidity so difficult for many to understand? Great takeaway, great question. Uh, lots and lots of history is a really simple answer, but yeah, and I'm not gonna answer these questions actually. We'll have time for questions at the end, but I wanna hear your questions. But first, takeaways. Well, it just struck me that um, mostly in my adult life, I've learned that Life in general is not the binary one, zero, yes, no. Um, and it's not either or. It's, uh, is it either and? Anyway, so, um, and this kind of confirms that, yeah. but this is kind of a big, a big part of our lives that yeah. we have to try to adjust to. So mm -hmm. that would be the next question. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Other, other takeaways? Bob? I got it. Got it? I know, yeah. Just stay oh. in one place. Oh, my takeaway came from this uh, genius woman right here at our table. Oh, she Barbara? Said, she is we're on a We're on a spectrum, you know. Um, I, uh, I told her, I told the table, I've been looking for some insights on this transgender thing. I've never... Uh, um, personally been able to imagine anything like um, a woman trapped in a man's body. I realize this happens and it's a big thing, but I, I can't personally imagine it. And uh, so I was looking for insights on that. And that's, this is the portion of your presentation that addresses that. And she said, what's your first name? Barbara. Barbara. She said, we're on a spectrum. And I said, oh, that's genius. Yeah between maleness and femaleness and all that, we're on a spectrum. Uh, we hear that now, as I said, with autism. Are you autistic or not? No, you're on a spectrum. <laughs> yeah, right, there's lots of different ways of thinking about things. Um, yeah, so I, so I do, I wanna sort of address the thing you said about sort of the experience of being trans. 
there are lots of ways that trans people um, talk about the experience of, of being trans. You named one of them, that's not the only experience. So I hope, one of the things I hope from this is that the tool helps you think about things and then the people in our lives um, help us actually like love people and be in relationship. That's the really important part. This helps us understand people, um, but there is no one way of thinking about a particular experience. I do not speak for all straight white women. Sometimes I wish I did. I think I have good ideas, but I do not speak for all straight white women. There's a lot of straight white women in this room who have a lot of different life experiences. So we keep that in mind and try not to be reductive in, in what sort of how we're thinking about people's experiences. That's really helpful, Bob and Barbara. Maybe one more takeaway from folks. Okay, cool. We'll let it, we'll let it sit. So you have the gender bread person to take home and look at and read and talk to your friends about if it's appropriate to talk to your friends about these kinds of, well, it's always appropriate, but we do it with care. That's the important part. Uh, so I'm gonna move us in a different direction. Sorry, there's a lot here and there are a couple of other really important things that I wanna share. So you're gonna skip question? For now, Thank for you. now I'm skipping questions. It's a good exercise. Keep your questions in your brain or write them down if that helps you. Um, okay. An acronym. So now we're thinking more about, uh, less about sex, sexuality, gender, more about what it means to live in a body and respect other people's bodies. This is not just for children. This is for, for us, this is for those of us who are in relationship with young people, and um, it's really important. So this is an acronym that we sometimes use to help us think about bodily autonomy, which is all about what it means to um, have a body and sort of be in control of that body in age-appropriate ways. First one, privates are private. Second one, always remember that your body belongs to you does not belong to somebody else. Third one is no means no. Sometimes we say no is a complete sentence. You don't have to explain yourself. No, end of, end of conversation. T, talk about the secrets that upset you. Um, and especially with the younger ones, we talk about the difference between secrets and surprises. And we say that grown-ups uh, don't ask us to keep secrets that we don't feel comfortable keeping. Uh, this is important for grown-ups too, actually. Secrets versus surprises, this is uh, really important. And then the last one, which encapsulates all of this, is speak up because somebody can help. If any of these things feel out of balance, uh, we talk about our bodies giving us signals about how things are feeling. If my tummy feels a little not quite right about something that's happening, I tell a grown-up that I can trust. If, and if you want to have this, I can send it to you. Just let me know. Don't feel like you have to furiously scribble things down. Um, this is, yeah, this is just a helpful tool to think about our, our bodies in relationship to other people. And the opposite of it is also true. When I'm thinking about the body of a friend or a loved one, um, their body belongs to them. It does not belong to me. Even if I'm married to that person, even if that person is my child or my grandchild, their body belongs to them. Really important. And, and you could keep, keep going down the list. No means no. No is a complete sentence. A few other key themes that we often touch on, uh, consent. This is about what it means for somebody to say, it's okay to touch me in a particular way, or it's okay to be with me intimately in a particular way. Um, you are probably as troubled as I am by news stories about rape culture on college campuses and um, the ways that lack of consent shows up in our young people's lives is really, really troubling. Um, it's important to talk about this, 
to say it out loud, that no is a complete sentence, that consent needs to be enthusiastic, that consent can always change. You cannot consent if you're under the influence of substances. All of these things are really important, and, and some of that we don't talk about with a second grader. It's all age appropriate and stages. Um, but for you all, really important to treat these things with care. We talked about bodily autonomy. Um, we also talk about peer pressure, especially with uh, kids as they get a little bit older. Um, one, of the, one of the things that Sonia did last year with the older students, which I loved, was uh, sort of a case study. So she said to the kids, if somebody's on the playground and they're saying, ooh, you should go, you should go give that person a kiss on the cheek, which, I mean, this stuff happens on the playground, believe you me. Um, what do you do to respond to it? So it helps to have tools in our toolbox. I don't know about you, but I do, not with this conversation, but with any number of things, it helps to rehearse, to have sentences that you say. So some of them were like, um, well, that's uncomfortable. I'm going to go walk this off. And then you just walk away. That's one of the scripts that you might use. Or, um, no offense, but kissing somebody on the playground is not my idea of fun. And then you walk away. Um, or you turn the attention to the instigator. Uh, why do you care so much? And then you walk away. Or just no, again, no is a complete sentence. So peer pressure is something we don't talk about as much with grown-ups, I think, but it's really, really important with kids, and we are not immune to it either. Uh, the, the last thing is something that I care a lot, a lot, a lot about, body image. And we touched on a little bit of this with your sticky notes. Some of this came out in, in the sort of what does it mean to be a woman or a man. Um, it's hard to be a, a teenager. It's always been hard to be a teenager, but I think right now it's really hard to be a teenager and a person entering puberty. There are a lot of messages out there about what my body should look like um, and how I should treat other people's bodies and social media is um, super scary with this stuff. The, the Surgeon General came out with a warning this past year about how damaging social media is to girls, in particular boys too, and, and um, gender non-conforming kids, but especially girls, about how they think about their bodies. Um, it's really, really important. So particularly with the older students, we talk a lot about um, what it means to, for God to affirm that our bodies are beautiful. And I use that word, beautiful. Um, intentionally, not pretty, not, you know, whatever else. Your body is beautiful the way that God made you, no matter what. Um, yeah, there's more I could say about that, but I think I'll leave it there. Those are, those are a few of the key things that we talk about. So I'm, I'm going to move us into a blessing that I like to do at this, at the end of this workshop, and um, again, participate in the way that feels right to you. This will be sort of the conclusion of presentation time, and then we'll move to, to questions. Um, so I'm going to invite you, if you feel comfortable, to stand. And if you need to stay sitting, this will work too. So this is a blessing uh, that invites us to think about our bodies and to bless them because God blesses them and calls them holy and beautiful. So would you just do what I do and we'll move through this blessing together. Thank you, God, for beautiful hands, for hands that reach out to hug a neighbor, for hands that hold paintbrushes and tickle the ivories, for hands that embrace a loved one. Thank you, God, for beautiful hands. Thank you, God, for beautiful feet. For feet that march for justice. For feet that pedal bike pedals. For feet that run at the playground. Thank you, God, for beautiful feet. Thank you, God, for beautiful eyes, for eyes that see the belovedness of the other, for eyes that look out 
for the pain and the beauty in the world, for eyes that wear contacts and glasses. Thank you, God, for our beautiful eyes. Thank you, God, for beautiful ears, for ears that hear the ringing of the bells, for ears that wear hearing aids or cochlear implants, for ears that listen out for the cries of friends and neighbors in need. Thank you, God, for beautiful ears. And thank you, God, for our beautiful bodies, for the ways that they move in strange and beautiful and hard and complicated ways, and for the ways that you move through them. Thank you, God, for beautiful bodies. Amen. You can be seated. So I think we'll move to, to questions with the very important caveat that I am not an expert in anything, but really am not an expert in this. So I may point you to resources. I'm just gonna wait till the bells finish. <laughs> A moment to use our brains to think about our questions, right? Our ears and our brains, and then, yeah. <laughs> okay, one more thing to share. On your handout is a resource page. I, I do wanna just actually walk us through that page real quick. Um, and there's a bunch of children's books on this table over here. Some belong to the church library, some belong to Sonia. Uh, you're welcome to look at them during lunch or later. So there are some books on the list. These are some of the ones that I really like. There are, is more where that came from, for sure. First one's a children's book about gender nonconformity. If you want to talk to your kids about what it means that somebody's using they, them pronouns instead of he, she, she, her, etc., that's a really great one. Super age appropriate for little ones. Second one is um, a, a puberty book for girls. I grew up with the, the like American Girl doll one. Others of you? No? Okay, this is a me thing. Anyway, this is one that I really, really like. Sonia Renee Taylor um, is, is awesome. The next one is definitely for older teens. It's sort of a graphic novel style book about sex and consent. It's really great. It's, you need to look at it before you gift it to somebody because there's pictures and things in there, but it's really good. And then the last one, Austin Hartke has been a speaker at Westminster before. He um, has written a number of really good books and resources. This is, I think, his sort of like baseline intro one. It's been a while since I looked at it, but it's, it's great. Um, and Austin Hartke himself is trans and writes from that lived experience. Okay, and then other media. This one is a sort of a strange one, but, a, but like a meditation and body awareness YouTube channel. We spend also a lot of time in the FYC world thinking about how we calm our bodies when we need to calm them and how we use our bodies to run off steam when that's what we need. These are great little meditations. More Light Presbyterians and Covenant Network of Presbyterians. These would be resources grounded in our particular place in the Christian tradition, um, sort of vetted theological and biblical resources. And gosh, they have resource libraries with lectures and videos and books and articles, and it's all really good stuff. Okay, the last one, if you care about um, dismantling anti-fat bias which is really important to me. We didn't talk about that today, but I care a lot about that. This is a great place to start. The language is a little salty. I felt I needed to give that disclaimer, but just so you know. Okay, those are the resources. Now I'm done talking until it's time for me to answer a question. <laughs> we have a question online for you. How do you reconcile fearful and wonderfully made with the trans community or with children born with cancer? Really, really tender question. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's a little sound bite that I can give you about that. I, I could certainly point you to really good resources and I don't actually feel equipped to, to fully go there. Um, but I would say that, that God, 
God embraces the fullness of who we are. That feels like a really baseline um, thing in, in, in our community that, that feels like I can affirm that. God embraces the fullness of who we are, no matter what. And also, the truth of, of the story of Jesus is that Jesus goes with us all the way, that we are never alone, that we journey together. Um, so I think I'm going to leave that one there. I, I, I don't know that I can go farther than that, but, but that's a really tender question. Yeah. Other questions? Nope. Alexander, I have a, have a this close. Can you? Yes. Yeah. I have a question about your students. When you teach this, if someone comes to you and say, "I have a situation that I need to discuss with you that I can't discuss at home," yeah. how do you deal with that? And is, is there staff here that you mm. resource with? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Carol. Also such a tender tender and, and thoughtful question. Yeah, we have um, a full system of how we think and talk about um, being in relationship with young people at Westminster. We have a really great, um, it's like a full handbook on child and youth safety. And so there are sort of protocols that, that we go through around that, but the main thing is affirming a child's goodness and, and getting the child the, the resources that they need. There's also no, this may be obvious, but there's no one-on-one -on -one with children. We have a rule of a triangle, right? If there's one adult, if there's one child, there's at least another one. Two kids with one adult or two adults with one kid. There's never one-on-one, -on -one. like that stuff is really important. Um, but yeah, and, and not pretending like we have all the resources and answers. I'm a pastor, I'm not a, I'm not a licensed counselor, I'm not a therapist, I'm not um, a social worker. So, so getting folks the resources they need. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Alexander, can you define fearfully in the scripture? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> how, you, how you would define it. Yeah, I think um, I'm gonna lean on my colleague Margaret for this. If you wanna, if you wanna do like any any ad libbing here, but but I think this participates in a larger um, understanding of like the fear of the Lord, which is something about the awe and the wonder and the beauty and the majesty, the feeling you get when you stand like on a cliff and look down, the fearful, um, like not like I'm afraid of monsters kind of fear. What's a better example? Something you'd actually be afraid of. I'm afraid, whatever else you're afraid of in life, um, but, but that God has created us. Take the mic, Margaret. I was about to say nothing to add. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, that's, so something like that's that. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I think a sort of a sense of, of awe. You know, we yeah. wouldn't say awfully made, but we are full of awe right. in the presence of God. And I think that's the, the sense yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alexandra, can you talk a little bit about pronoun usage? Sure, yeah. I should have I should have had this in my in my thing. You probably are thinking about it a lot. Um, pronouns are the ways that we refer to one another. Pronouns are just a part of speech. They are not a political tool. They are not, uh, despite whatever you're reading in the news, it's just a way that we think about one another. So I use the pronouns she, her, um, which means if you talk about me, you say, oh, Alexandra's so awesome, she's great at what she does. For instance, just for instance. <laughs> And um, I have friends who use they, them pronouns. That means that they, um, that she, her doesn't feel right for them for whatever reason. That's up to them. That is not my story to tell. It's their story to tell. Um, and that means that, that I say, um, this is a fake person. Oh, Liam is so awesome. They are a great student. That's just that. Um, language uh, is descriptive, not prescriptive. That's sort of the nature of things. Language changes over time, whether we like it or not. A lot of us don't like it. Uh, it's uncomfortable, but this is a way that language is changing. And we affirm people's full humanity and dignity by using the pronouns that they have told us that they prefer. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Um. See, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. I have, we have a, a young lady in our family 
And that's the question. I use that term, young lady. That's not comfortable for her. I use the term young woman. I'm, I, I'm not sure it has to be young whatever, but I'm, and she said to me, I don't know what you should say. <laughs> Great, so I think you follow their lead, right? Yeah. 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 And, but can you help me? Because um, there are times when I'm about to say something and I'm a little stymied. Yeah. Because you love this person, right? They're a family member and you care about them. <laughs> Ken, I know you. Um, I think gender neutral language is actually great. I, a lot of times when I meet somebody new, if I'm referring to them, I just say them. It's not, um, the kids say, it's not that deep. Um, another way to say that would be, it's, it's okay to just try, try things out and follow the lead of the person that you're talking to. So you, part of that is listening and not assuming. It's mirroring back what someone has just given to you. And it's also not asking questions that they're not comfortable answering. Because it's something that we sometimes do with people is assume that they're ready to be our teacher about something when really they're just trying to live their lives. I don't know the story of the young person that you know and love, but um, I think those are some of the things that, that are helpful. Ken, is it possible to just use her name? Here, wait a minute. Yeah, but as you talked about, pronouns float around. That's and that right. Wasn't, you know, um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, I will say for any of you who have not had, or let's see, for any of you who have struggled with the conversation or the pronoun or whatever, just bumbling into it raises joy I experience in the other person. The fact that you're trying it even if you mess it up. Yeah, I think so. And I think um, sometimes we get so afraid we're gonna say something wrong that we just stop. That's usually not the right move unless you're harming someone and, and you can read people's body language and facial expressions well enough to know when that's happening. But um, a way that we respect people is by also apologizing when we get it wrong. This happens to me all the time. Again, I work with kids. Uh, who live in a lot of different sort of gender and sexuality expressions and we get it wrong and we say, oh, I'm so sorry. And they say, that's okay. And I say, I'll do better next time. And then we move on with, with our day. Yeah. yeah. We have uh, family members who are in a uh, conservative Christian church and we've had conversations with them over the years on many topics and, they, and I've heard them say, that uh, gender is binary, mm -hmm. it's not on a spectrum, mm -hmm. that uh, gay people who act on their behaviors are committing sins, mm -hmm. and y we can go on. Mm -hmm. And usually they'll, the rationale they'll use will come from biblical passages, mm -hmm. which they've learned in their Christian education courses from the time they were children. And I'm wondering, given your experiences, um, do you have any advice on how we might try to have conversations effectively with folks whose values on these very issues are really, really different than the ones that uh, my wife and I carry? And I will say too that uh, these fam we love these family members, and I mean that. They're, yeah. they're, they're people that we feel closest to and are among all our family members but there is really a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. any, any suggestions or advice? Because we're gonna see him again for the rest of our lives. That's right. <laughs> the complicated joy of loving people is that, yeah, we don't agree with them on everything. Um, and it's especially fraught when the thing we don't agree about is something that denies the full personhood of people that we love. So this is not the same as like, I voted for so-and-so person. This is, um, this is deep. This is really can be harmful. Um, the, the biblical passages you're talking about, are, we sometimes call them clobber passages because people use them to, 
to, to hurl at other people in really harmful ways. Um, and I could point you to some really good resources there, although I don't actually know that that's the helpful way to go about it, sort of countering somebody's harmful theology with our more liberative theology. I think um, there's more, more sort of relational ways to go about it. I think, Tim, because I know you and Joe, you're probably doing a pretty good job at it. Um, all that's to say, I don't really have any good advice. <laughs> Yeah. Resources wouldn't hurt. Sure. Um, not that we're going to fight over it, but the people who are in our lives that I'm talking about tend to read the Bible. Yeah. And we would we would like to be able to say, but have you have you have you read this passage? And and if you have, or if they have, well, what do you think about that? Yeah. Because we can talk we can talk that way. It's right. not edged. The conversations are not edged in hostility. Right. Which is a, a gift. There's an openness there. But yeah. the divergency is so huge that it's like, mm -hmm. oh gosh, how can this be? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, may I refer you back to this was before I got here. I think it was my interview weekend, but I think Matt had invited Austin Holkey, is that how you say his Harky. last name? Harkey. Um, to come and do an adult ed series here that should be in our archives mm -hmm. that may actually be an important, a, a helpful resource for this. But I would agree in general, like I don't find it helpful to start with, with debates. I find it helpful to start with relationship and it sounds like that's where you are, <laughs> you know, in, in this. Um, so I want to affirm that as, yeah. just as Alexandra did. Yeah. It just strikes me right now that the experience of binary is really very freeing in the big world. The, can you say that one more time, Polly? I'm sorry. Freeing. The so, experience of binary. If we... Fluidity. No, pardon? Fluidity rather than binary. Oh. Binary means this or that. Okay. So like what? Yeah, a binary would be like you're a man or a woman. Um, to break those binaries. I'm learning, I'm learning this today, that's why I'm here. No, I know, I'm so glad. So I think I'm hearing you say that the experience of, of breaking that down and just being yes, is yes. really freeing. It is freeing. I think so too, uh, yeah. And it is endearing. If someone is open enough to mm -hmm. share that or to require you to respond to them mm -hmm. uh, with some... I don't know what I'm trying to say exactly. Yeah, I don't know the language, I don't think. Sure. But there's something about openness in the yes. whole discussion, and we're all kind of shying away from it more than daring to um, mm -hmm. express, maybe. Oh, what am I talking about? No, that was, that was beautiful, Polly. You're, wor you're working this out in your mind, as we all are, even those of us who think about this a lot. I mean, I think... Um, Binary thinking, I don't know if it's innate to who we are as humans. Sometimes it feels that way. Like it's just so easy to categorize things. So much more complicated to get rid of the categories. But, it, but there are really beautiful things beyond the borders. Like heaven. Yeah. I think so. This doesn't drop, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Ready, Reverend? Or is, is somebody else still talking? No, you're, you're good, Bob, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Reverend, in uh, addition to the insights I looked, hoped to gain and did gain, uh, it really caught my ear at the beginning of your presentation. You said your usual audience is 6 to 12 and, uh, or older, and these are children that will be entering adolescence. And if you're their counselor and advisor, your day job as a Presbyterian minister, they'll be entering adolescence with, uh, with you in Presbyterian theology. Uh, and you're, I don't know how closely you're bound to what you might find in scripture and to what you find makes sense in your own, in your own mind. Now, I entered adolescence with, uh, uh, with Catholic theology and, uh, I, uh, when, it, when it came time to be educated in catechism about what's a sin and what's not, and uh, the sexual sins were uh, introduced as, uh, um, they, they, they talked about, they chose words carefully. If, if you have a nocturnal emission, they said. 
<laughs> that's fine, that's God's will. Well, that uh, may not be obvious what that was. It certainly wasn't obvious to me at that age. I didn't really know what sex was, and I had not, well, they're referring, of course, to a wet dream in which semen comes out in a dream. Understood, And uh, yep. they said, well, that's okay. That's a sexual dream. That's okay, it's God's will. But if you were to make that happen the next day with your own hand, that's a sin, and that's got to be confessed. And uh, when I was just at the start of this, I was saying, that you, I would, would you have to, uh, if you found something absurd in Presbyterian theology, would you have to tell the kids to turn their back on that? Um, I, uh, of course, eventually, oh, would you know why doing it yourself by your own hand and can, would, would be not, a sin? I can take that. Unless would it be a sin? Well, I'll tell you. You're spilling your seed. The semen is just discarded. Sure. You're spilling yeah. your so seed. Bob, I'm going to yeah. um, pull us back together. Um, and Alexandra, do you want to respond to this? Sure, yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people probably have received similar kinds of messages growing up in lots of different faith traditions. That's not really what we're about. The sort of very like, here's this and this and this, and here's what we think about this and this and this. Um, our tradition is wonderfully, beautifully expansive. Um, everything is rooted in relationship. When we're at our relationships retreat with the senior highs, um, it, it's, it's, it's grounded in um, generative mutual relationship and we're not, we're not so interested in the, the, the sort of that, that kind of conversation. Um, again, it's a little bit of binary thinking there and we try to break that down a bit. Um, but I do hope that church is a place where we can ask, ask good, hard questions. Um, anything you want to add, Margaret? Yeah, no, I, I like that. It's, it's not a sort of matter of is this act A, B, or C okay or not okay. It's yeah, not no. as much a checkbox. It's, it's grounded in a much sort of more relational and deeper theological. Yeah. I think that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got Larry and then Suzanne, and then we'll get off to lunch. Great my question away. Um, my question was, can I be friends and not understand the person's sexuality? Oh my goodness. I have so many friends who do things I don't understand. I mean, don't you? Like, we, we, that's great. I mean, I think if somebody's asking you to uh, affirm something about them and you can't do that, I think you've got, a, you've got a bigger conversation about what it means to be a friend to someone. But also, I have a lot of friends who do a lot of things I don't understand, not with their sexuality, but um, it's just part of being a human. Uh, we can love people without fully understanding the depth of their experience, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to have friends at all. I, I, right? Yeah, and some people do live that way, and it's, I don't think it's that fun or interesting. <laughs> I, I can't answer that for you, I don't think. I mean, I think we, we know how to be good friends, and that means um, seeking understanding and acceptance, and that, that does feel pretty core to, to friendship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a paid commercial announcement. In 2005, um, North Como Presbyterian Church, which is now known as New Life Church, mm -hmm published a book called Ordination Standards, Biblical, Theological, and Scientific Perspectives. It's probably in the Westminster Library. We distributed it pretty heavily through um, the Presbytery. And that has some very good scholarly and um, in, in way, it, we, we had both conservative and um, liberal people on the task force that developed that book. I was one of them. And um, we tried to give a balanced approach. And if you ever really want to look at the very in-depth um, discussion about the biblical passages that re reference, that we understand as referencing uh, homosexuality, that's a good place to go because we did a very thorough job on it. Thanks. Ordination Standards, Biblical, Theological, and Scientific Perspectives. It's a phone book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Alexandra, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic presentation. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah. I am, uh, I am, I am so grateful for your ministry here, and I am jealous of the kids who are growing up with this kind of instruction. So thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Yes, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing it with us. Before we break for lunch, let me tell you about the spring uh, third age forums. There will not be a March program as we continue to observe Lent or start to observe Lent next week. Uh, the April forum will be cultivating resilience on Wednesday, April 10th with Westminster's artist in residence, Wendy Brown Baez. Learn how we can ra rise above life's challenges when we feel overwhelmed. Explore how to access your inner guidance and creative insights to deepen your courage and relieve stress. Then on Wednesday, May 8th, we'll be building community through arts and, cu and culture. Ben Johnson, who is the director of the Minneapolis Department of Arts and Culture Affairs, along with our own Dr. Amanda Weber, will engage in conversation on the ways our city and Westminster can nurture arts and culture downtown. Ben feels it's important to have Minneapolis be at the forefront of progressive arts ideas, creativity, and leadership. He has always felt that Minneapolis was the North Star for innovation and experimentation, so a lot of energy will be placed in developing support programs to sustain and position our community in the best ways possible. I do have flyers. Sorry about that. I do have flyers available. They are on the two round tables in the back as you leave. You're welcome to grab those. And um, Margaret, will you lead us in grace? Absolutely. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this time together, for this place of openness, this chance to learn and explore. We ask your blessing on the food that is before us. We give thanks for those who prepared it and brought it here. Help us to enjoy a time of conversation together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. Lunch is in the back. We have uh, Jimmy John's sandwiches and chips. And today we've got Reese's peanut butter cups in, in place of cookies. Um, so come and enjoy lunch.